<laughs> everybody now is uh everyone now is dropping uh is dropping cable and whatever but it is what it is uh it was good news so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna celebrate uh the good news as it comes it's four to five million homes it's a huge that's a huge uh, shot for our first. We should just get like if if RuPaul has like We TV, he's got you know why can't we just get a a new TV channel, right? I know. I know. Well, listen, we by again very soon everyone's going to be able to have their own channel. Uh, you'll be able to have your own TV channel. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a different world now, which is good because it opens up the possibilities for lots of new voices to be heard. But uh, and um, so this is this is uh, this is good news. And again, um, it's always a it's always a, uh, a, a you know you have some good news. You got to just take it in and not you know think about the stuff you don't have, right? So right. we're still trying to get this in, Mike. It's okay. Come on in. We're gonna get started. We're, we're uh, he tried to update it, which was a really good idea to try to update the settings for for uh, for. Um, Zoom, and by the way, I was trying to tell you, please make sure, you know, it's a good thing if you're using Zoom, which you are, because you're all on right now. Yeah. What? Okay, that you should update your Zoom setting. Make sure your uh, Zoom uh, update is the newest one because you may have some glitches if you don't. So when you go on your Mac or whatever to say, uh, check updates under Zoom, you go under uh, Zoom and, and on, the, on the, where it says zoom.us, you go down, it'll say check for updates. If you check for updates, it will uh, tell you and right now it told me that an update is available. I'm not going to do it right now because it'll shut up. <laughs> but sure enough, I'm not updated. So there you go. The guy, the guy, the, the, the uh, doctor needs to heal himself, right? So, um, but uh, yeah, check your Zoom settings. Not now, not at this uh -oh. time. Check them and uh, again, go under Zoom and, and, uh, and get your, get your uh, thing working. All right, so let's take a look at, at the Torah. Did, does anyone else have anything else to share? Again, I'm so glad that Joyce is back in person. Uh, and uh, it's such an important thing that we, we have our, our support group. That was such a big mitzvah that she did it and uh, started it in the pandemic and that it's back up and running and, um, and it's so important. So we really appreciate that. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. It's one of my blessings. Thank yeah. you. But uh, um, so we're going to we're going to continue with uh, chapter 29 of Genesis as the first words of this at the very top of, uh, of of the page right here that Jacob resumed his journey. We're going to resume our journey through Genesis. His, so Genesis chapter 29, which is. Do you have a page number on yours, Mary? She's got a different book. So for the people that have it now, <laughs> wait, hold a second. I'm going to get, I'm going to get Joanne set up. And give us a uh, it's always something. Well, this is, this is low tech. This is a low tech problem. It's an easily solvable problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so what we read last week was the uh, marriage of Jacob to not one, but two beautiful women. Well, actually, one beautiful woman and one woman who might have been beautiful, but just had weak eyes. But the reality is that, uh, uh, no, we're not on chapter 29, sorry. Uh, we're in chapter 30. We, we read chapter 29 last week. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, we left off with the fact that um, Jacob was with Rachel, uh, cohabited with her. He came to unto her and he loved Rachel more than Leah and he served another seven years. And the words that we find today that we kind of start with is the fact that these are women now who are going to start having children. And we're gonna read about the birth of the 12 tribes now, plus Dina, Dina who is the daughter. Um, and what we kind of, where we kind of left off was the fact that it says here that Leah was unloved and Adonai opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And what's interesting about that is it seems like maybe Leah wouldn't have had kids either 
if it wasn't for the fact that God opened her womb. Or it basically says that because she was unloved, God opened her womb and she was ready to have children. But it is kind of strange that there seems to be this idea that it's because God compensated for the lack of love that Leah had mm -hmm. that she starts to have children. That's what it says. And again, it says the word Rachel was an akara. Rachel was an akara, which is the word that we have in Hebrew that we don't have in English. Uh, well, we say barren, but, uh, but this is a word for a barren woman. Because um, technically you'd say Rachel was a barren woman, where it says Rachel was barren. Um, an akara is a, is, a, is a woman, is a type of woman who can't have a child. So uh, it seems as though, again, in some cases, people who are barren do have kids, which means that they're not always uh, not able to have children. Um, but in Hebrew, the phrase that God opened her womb, it says, Vayiftach et rachama. And the word racham or rachem, the root for that, El, El Male Rachamim is mercy or compassion. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about this is that you could also read it as seeing that Leah was unloved, Adonai opened up her mercy. Her mercy or compassion. And what's interesting about that is that again the hebrew word for for womb and or for mercy is it's synonymous i mean you there's no difference in the word um and um and uh it is a really really weird situation that um that it seems as though god intervenes in a way that is either well it's either a supernatural occurrence or it is um or it is hold it one second this is michael calling hold it one second hi michael it's it's uh the zoom is not working we can't log in to zoom from the computer so we, the password's not working we get on all right yeah i know i know we'll have to we'll have to figure it out all right. Yeah, we're okay for that, but we can't project it. So we'll talk about it later. Don't worry. All right. Thanks. So yeah, we're, that, that was unfortunate. We can't fix it for now, but um, anyways, the next, so, so if God, you know, intervenes and can get, can get this, uh, can, can help her, uh, that leaves Rachel without, without being able to have children. And that's where we're at with that line. The next line says that Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben, for she declared it means that Adonai has seen my affliction. It also means now my husband will love me. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that, again, you'll notice that there'll be uh, asterisks where, again, the name will be explained. So the names are not being translated, obviously. They're being explained in Hebrew why the name was being used and uh and so the names all mean something and we're gonna we'll hear what every one of these names means of course it's interesting uh, that this name means do things um now when she says god sees my affliction it could be understood that the affliction is the fact that her husband doesn't love her. That would be probably the most straightforward, but it also could be the fact that she was not able to have children also, that she was also barren and that God opened her womb, meaning God let her have babies when she wasn't going to have babies, which means that Rachel and Leah both to begin with, are essentially infertile. But that God intervenes and helps them, or at least help one of them so far. We know he's going to help the other. Don't worry. But 
It's interesting that this seems to be, again, a pattern that we saw. We saw it with, with Sarah already. We saw it with Rebecca. And now we see it with Rachel and possibly Leah. Because when she then also says, now my husband will love me, it seems pretty clear that she's saying, now that I've had a child, my husband's going to love me. Which seems to mean that she has now something to give her husband. She has something that will cause him to love her. But it's also this idea that now that she is able to have children, she has something that her sister doesn't have. Now she has something that her husband wants. And now she seems to be favored by God. But you're saying the name Reuben actually means do something? Well, here's the thing. Re Reuven definitely happens as, well, I shouldn't say definitely. None of these names definitely mean anything other than what the author or what the Torah is telling us that they mean, because that's what it says it means. Look, the word Reuven is connected with the word Ra'ah, Ro'ed, to see. Um, and the first part is Ra'a, God sees, and then uh, um, and then it says Be'aneni in my affliction. So Ra'a Be'aneni Be'aneni is Ra'a Be'aneni becomes Re'uvein. It's a com combination of two words. The thing is, is that Oh. It could be, but there's no, I mean, it sounds like it is. It sounds, the words sound enough, sound the same, but it seems like that probably wasn't really what the word Reuven originally meant. Did they invent these names? I, I mean, the it, Torah. It I, almost looks like it says um, they see a sun. Right. You know, Ra'u, like like they they see, and then gain a son. Yeah, well, that's that would be that would be the logical possibility that the word Ben there means son, and like look a son, look mm -hmm. a son, look everyone a son, but that's not the way that they told it. That's not the way it tells us that the word Ben is not there. It's it's the word Oni or 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 um, or own or uh inui, which means an affliction it's actually the word that we use is the root for what we're supposed to do at and um at yom kippur to afflict our ourselves the word affliction is uh is that word it's like causing pain or something like that so and it's also the bet from that in my affliction so the word the letter bet means in and and the Anani is my affliction, it is the affliction, my affliction, actually. So in my affliction, God has seen me in my affliction. So there you get the bet and the nun, and you know, there's where the bet and nun comes from, not from, as Sarah says, the more likely, which is Ben, which means son. So and then there's of course the second part, which is, and now my husband will love me, which that doesn't seem to be there at all. The words "my husband loves me," well, she is not really there at all. I mean, there's those letters; those letters don't come in any any way to make the name Reuven. But you could also say again, "He got to see my affliction, and now my husband loves me." Well, that's a nice that's a nice name. Um, but again, there's this sense that this son is going to change my life. By making my husband love me. This is going to change my situation because my husband will now love me because I've had a child. It's it's so tragic. It's like it's like she thinks um maybe the fact that it doesn't that, that his name doesn't mean that. Um it says so much about what she wants from him in terms of what she's hoping she's gonna get from having a child, and that she doesn't get it. That he doesn't he doesn't love her more because she's had a son for him. Uh, absolutely. And we, we and know that because that of the way some of these know. names will take on other meanings later on in these young people, in these, not young people, in these, well, they're young now, in these kids, when they grow up, their names actually, to some extent, have, you know, they have other meanings later on too, right? And so it's not just at their birth, 
but that their names essentially later on also kind of take on new meanings. So for example, we have stories about, well, we'll get to it when we get to it, when we get down to those kids. It's just how delusional she is about what she yeah. thinks is going to win his love and that not, nothing does. Yeah. And that's an important point that, that Sarah just shared is that, you know, this is, she's, she's wrong, but let's read it and we'll see why she's wrong. But yes. So then she conceived again and bore a son and declared, this is because Adonai heard that I was unloved and has given me this one also. So she named him. <laughs> so now we see she's still unloved. And the word, the name Shimon is a play on the word Shema, right? Like Shema Yisrael, Shema Adonai. God will, God heard. So she's still saying God heard me because I'm unloved. Uh, and the word Snua could also be despised or disliked. Unloved is actually the most gentle of those. Uh, that's the root we have for for not liking something pretty strongly sometimes mm -hmm. so um and so she says that i've gotten this one also that it's still not working so the second son essentially is mentioned for this is, is named for the same reason uh and the, again it is very possible that the the root for shimon was shema god will hear something to do with that i mean we have that root in several names like we have the name yishmael right which is god will hear yishmael we have the name shmuel samuel which is also god will hear those are all roots that have sh uh, shem shema shema as part of it that god will hear or to be heard right so that's the second son shimon again she conceived and bore a son and declared this time my husband will become attached to me for I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. So Levi is a play on the word Yelave. Yelave means to attach. And so she says that the name Levi is a, gives us a sense of attachment, which is, I guess, a little bit nicer in the sense that she doesn't say it's because I'm unloved. But she's definitely still not feeling attachment, and she's still not feeling close to her husband. And there's a real question whether he ever was attached to her. But now she's had three sons, and she feels that, like, now I'm going to, um, now he's going to, he'll, he'll, he'll definitely love me. And the Levites, that's a pretty important tribe. The descendants of Levites, we still know who those people are today. The people who are Levites, they were Levies, Levines. And other variations of that, Lewitt. And, yeah, just lots of variations of, of the Levy name. So the Levy name became pretty important uh, for all those people who are Levites. Um. But it seems like she's softening a little bit. It seems like she's a little, I mean, she's still thinking about this, but she's not, she's no longer saying my husband doesn't like me. She's no longer saying, uh, you know, I'm unloved. She's now saying maybe my, maybe she's saying it a little bit more positive way. That now my husband will become attached to me. Um, and she doesn't focus on the fact, she doesn't say it's because he doesn't love me. It's a little different. Now look what happens the fourth time. She conceived again and bore a son and declared, this time I will praise Adonai. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. And again, here it says the word, again, the name Yehuda, which according to this, and again, according to, like, this isn't a stretch at all, the root for this is hoda, or in this in this case, I will praise, which is ode, ode. That's the name. That's the word ode. I will praise. I will praise God. Um, notice this time, it has nothing to do with her husband. This last time, she finally says, "This time I will praise God," and she names him Judah. 
So Judah, to some extent, is the first time now, after having four children, that she can step back and say, I'm just happy. I'm going to praise God for what I have. It's almost as if she says now, my husband loves me. Okay, great. But I have something to celebrate. And she recognizes that her celebration is, you know, this is worth now focusing her energy on her kids and not on making sure that her husband is happy with her. So I will tell you. She's clearly in her 40s. <laughs> maybe. But it does then say she stopped bearing, that she stopped having kids after that. And it seems interesting that she stops having kids. We're on. Mike did not give up. And we are now on. Thank you, Mike. Did you log on on your own? You just have to hit join with video. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Did you do log on on your own account? How'd you do it? Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike. Mike did not give up. And now we're on. Uh, now we can see you. So, oh, sorry. sorry, it'll work now. <laughs> One of the needs is the, the me that's now in this sanctuary. There it is. So, uh, yes. uh, I just tried to get thanks, Mike. How did you do it? I was looking at uh, some of the. Uh, this Problem this happens a lot, actually, as it turns out. Mm. It's never yeah. happened to us. Mm. Like, it isn't happening. You just got to try it again. Well, thanks, Mike. So he didn't give up. There's also another way to get it, too. Yeah, but it's a secret passcode you can use for all meetings. Really? Yeah, I didn't try that one. Oh, okay. Is it my secret passcode or every one's secret passcode? <laughs> no, it's a, to all meetings. Are you kidding? No. You can get on any Zoom According meeting. According to what I just read, I didn't try. Right. Mike is going to go home and hack the Zoom meetings. I know, <laughs> I know Mike is going to do this when he goes home. He's not going to do anything bad, okay? I didn't say he's going to, but he's going to try it out. There's yes, no question. I'm sure that he's going to hack a bank. <laughs> no bank. No bank. Don't worry about that. Anyways. The good news is that you can get on Zoom meetings. Don't worry about that. Anyways. The good news is she's finally celebrating and having uh, a moment to stop thinking about the fact that she is not being loved by her husband. Because now, look, she's got a brood of boys. She's got four boys. I think at this point, one would normally say, enough, God, I don't need to have any more because four boys is a really tough thing to have um, in your house. Four boys, yes. It's, I would take three girls over four boys any day of the week. I would love to have sons. No, get me wrong. Don't, but I will tell you that is a big mess. Four boys is a huge mess. They're maybe not all slobs, but two out of four, three out of four. I work well. I'm thinking the three stooges in your house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> then maybe after, after two, two sons. <laughs> yeah, but my youngest daughter let me know that the two are they're gender neutral. You don't know that they're all boys are going to be this way. We didn't, yeah. It's not like I've she, never known them not to be this way. <laughs> I will tell you, for those who wonder, did he have more daughters? It's possible, but it does seem like when you do read about Dina, that they would have thrown us that information. But it is possible. Say that for every boy they had a girl. There is a midrash, exactly, that there was a girl in every one of these one of these uh births which is again you know goes back to the idea that adam and eve were conceiving twins and that's how they were wise for kids yeah that, it's, it, i don't want to think about it but it is it is it does get to the fertility when it does happen that you get and we do read about twins but it seems like when we read about twins they actually point out that they're twins uh but we usually by the way i don't think we have any cases of no, we don't, where it's a boy and a girl, and the toilet tells us that they're boy and girl fraternal twins. We have brothers and sisters, we have some real important ones coming up, but we don't have uh we don't have them necessarily being born at the same time. Though again, there are midrashim that some of those brothers and sisters that we read about were born at the same time. But the good news is is with four children, she stops having children. 
I will not say she stops having children permanently because she doesn't stop having children permanently. This is a cessation. This is a pause break, not a permanent break. But it seems like well, maybe it was going to be. I don't know. Um, and uh, and it says but ta'a mode. She stopped or she you know, came to a stop or pause or a standing, actually. The word amad, like amad, like an amida, means to stand. So it's like a standstill. And we still use that word, right? Standstill. She stopped uh, from, from bearing. She let it. All right. So that's where some people decided to have a chapter break with the birth of Judah. And of course, Judah is super, super important because he's the ancestor for the Jews. Uh, and by Jews, I mean the tribe of Judah that we call people still Jews uh, in his honor. The, the reality is, of course, is that by the time that the Jews were exiled by the Babylonians, the tribe of Judah had already taken in the tribe of Shimon. They had already taken in a lot of the tribe of Benjamin. They had already taken in a lot of the tribe of Levi, though we do know who the Levites are and the Kohanim. We know those tribes, but probably took in a decent amount of Levites as well. Probably we took in lots of, of um, over over the last 150 years before the Babylonians came in. When the Assyrians came in, they definitely dro drove a lot of people south. Probably a lot of people from Issachar and Zebulun and all the northern tribes. So there was probably a good amount of that blood too. We don't know how many, you know, what percentage of, of those people survived the Assyrian de defeats. Um, and we don't know how many survived, quite frankly, the Babylonian exile, but we do know that after that time, we only refer to the Judeans. We only call people uh, Judah. We don't call the, the, we don't, we actually don't really use the term Israel um, as a, as a nation or a, as an identity for the Jewish people until the modern nation of Israel. Now we still call ourselves B'nai Israel. We still call ourselves the children of Israel. But it's actually referring to a country or a, or a national polity that's Israel. We don't do that. We call ourselves Judah. We called ourselves Judea during the Roman period. We called ourselves, called the area Judea. And there was a very, very strong possibility that when Israel was established, they were going to call it Judea again. Because it was the last name for that country. The last name for that country before the Romans destroyed it 2,000 years ago, they destroyed Judea. They didn't call it Israel. The Judeans, the Maccabeans, those people who lived in Israel during the Greek period and the Persian period before, did not call it Israel. They called it Judah. So the name Judah is super important because we carry that name. And most, by the way, people don't refer to us as Israelites. We call people from Israel. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why Israel decided on the, the, the name Israel because there would be a difference between Jews and Israel. They recognized that there was Israel and that there was actually Judah uh, or the Jews. Um, so that was one of the main reasons why it wasn't called um, uh, Judea because there was a differentiation between, you know, and also the fact that this was a country that encompassed more than just the tribe of Judah. All of these things are important when we talk about this name. But again, the root of the name Judah is Oda, Odeh, to be uh, praising God, to give thanks. That's what we call it. Um, uh, and that's what we call Thanksgiving, Yom Ha'oda, ha the day of thanks, the day of giving thanks. So use the word modin to give thanks also. The, the root, or Toda, when you say Toda Rabbah. Thank you very much. So the, that root uh, is what she says, why she named her fourth son Judah. Thank you. Thank you. This time I will thank you, God. Now it's another way of saying it. Thank you, God. All right. So now we come to uh, uh, back to Rachel. And that's kind of why they broke the chapter. here. When Rachel saw that she had born Jacob no children, she became envious of her sister. And Rachel said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob was incensed at Rachel and said, can I take the place of God who has denied you fruit of the womb? I know, it sounds like fruit of the womb. I know we say that <laughs> every time, but that is the phrase that's used. Pre-vaten 
is a very fancy way of saying fruit of the, 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 the womb is children, that they are fruit, they are bearing fruit, being fruitful and multiplying. And here the word for, for womb is not rachama, it is baten. It is translated as womb, but it's actually a different word in Hebrew. And it's definitely much more, so, so I want to point that out only because it, it tells us that there was um, that there was a um, another word that could be used instead of the word that has a connotation of mercy. The word baten has much more of a, of a connotation of, uh, or not a connotation, but its root is much more rooted in the physio physiological and the fact that this is like the uterus, if you will. So I would ask- Medical term? Yeah. So I would have asked with the innards, you know? I would have definitely, the fruit of your innards, I would have definitely not translated it as the same word, but we really don't have a word for that different. We don't have those differentiating words in, um, well, I'd say womb is actually more poetic and uterus is a little bit more medical. Right. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, that is, they're, they're, all I'm telling you is it's a different word. And there is a definite sense that pre baten almost sounds more like what you'd say about a cow. Yeah? <laughs> because, because it really doesn't have that, it doesn't have that connotation of, of mercy, of spirit, of anything, you know, anything necessarily physical. There's almost a magical, mystical part of birth. Pre baten literally means like, is that, you know, is that animal ready to give birth? Is there, is there anything in there? Are there eggs in there? Whatever. Is there, is there, a, is there a penis in there? So it really has that connotation. And, and, um, and again, of course, that's not the point anyways. The point is, is that Jacob literally turns to her and says, and angrily, it says he's angry at her. It says he's vayachar af, which in Hebrew means his face got angry. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of the concept here is that it, that is, you know, he got mad. Um, and, he, and he says, or I can't, it's not me, it's God. Now, you could say, well, isn't he shifting the blame? Isn't he like, you know? Well, he's not because he's literally saying, look, clearly I can have children because your sister over there has already had four children. So it's not me. He doesn't say it to you, in all fairness. He doesn't say to his wife, Rachel, uh, it's on you. He actually says it's on God. So I will tell you, and in, in all fairness, why should he take responsibility? He, he loves her. We assume, we have to almost assume that he's sleeping with her and staying in her tent, by the way, which we actually kind of get very clearly that He's not sleeping with land normally. And the Torah actually says that. That's not just a midrash. You're going to see it in a moment when I'm talking about it. He, he, he isn't wrong for what he says. Um, did he have to get angry with her? I don't know. But he definitely is frustrated, has a reason to be frustrated, and definitely has a reason to say, it's not me. It's not me. Again, he doesn't say it's you. He says it's God. But he definitely seems to understand. We talked about this last week. That he seems to understand that these things are not in his hands. So he has made this deal with God that he's going to, God will be his God and he'll give up a, t a tenth of everything he has when God brings him back to the land and gives him everything that he asked for. Uh, but he does seem to understand it even now. And we ask, well, what's Jacob, where's Jacob spiritually? He definitely does understand that these things are not in his control. He says, I can't take the place of God. So there is this understanding that having a baby is a miracle. It's not just about having sex. It's about God doing something that allows a woman to have a child. Very important. You see a little bit in this text in the in the Bible what the view of birth was in in the Torah and for our for our people. 
which is a, this is a this is a divine act having a baby. Yep. And so, what does Rachel do? Rachel says, "Here's my my maid Bilhah. Consort with her that she may bear on my knees, and that through her I too may have children." And she gave him her maid Bilhah as a concubine, and Jacob cohabited with her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Now, of course, we've heard this before. We read it with Sarah and Hagar. This one, this time, very clear what she says. Sleep with her and it, let her bear on my knees. So here we have this very Handmaid's Tale version of the man's where they got it from, that you literally, you literally bear on the woman's knees so that it's almost as if she is giving birth to the child. So the surrogacy takes on a really powerful moment when this woman maybe again literally gave birth on top of her. I mean, that's wild. I mean, is it an idiom? Is it what was that really what happened? I mean, wasn't that just how um, uh, midwives did it though? Too is that they would they would um, sit on like um, sit on their on their you know on their feet with their knees bent on the ground, and they, and then women would would squat on their on their lap. So yes, it's very possible, and again, that still goes on in cultures where they have midwives. Um, that there are it's a very uh, intimate moment. But this is also, again, even more complex because she's not a midwife. She's not doing it as a midwife. She is saying that she's gonna give, that she's bearing on her knees. Not that she's gonna bear on her knees, that she's bearing on, on Rachel's knees. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm assuming there's a midwife there. There's two women who are very close to Bill. Now, it seems from what we just read that Jacob did not have sex with Bill up until this point. So the idea that she was given, we, we heard that Bill and Zilpah were given to Rachel and Leah when they got married to uh, to Jacob, and of course, as I told you, there is a midrash that Bilha and Zilpa are twin sisters, just like Rachel and Leah are twin sisters, and Bilha and Zilpa are actually other daughters of Laban. The the writers of the midrash did not like the idea that Bilha and Zilpa are just two random ladies from Aram. They don't like that idea. They want her. They want them to be from Abraham's family as well. Because again, if they're not, if they're if they're not from Abraham's family, then Jacob just wound up doing exactly what his father didn't want him to do, what his grandfather wouldn't have wanted him to do, Abraham wouldn't have wanted him to do, which is marry out of the family. So that's why Bill and Zilpah can't just be random maids. So that's why we have the midrash about it. Uh, again. To some extent, from the biblical standpoint, there's a ritual that goes on here where these kids that, that Bilhah will have will literally be Rachel's kids. They're not Bilhah's kids, they're my kids. And this is the handmaid's tale. You know, when people are infertile, that they have to uh, find somebody that they can essentially take their kids. So this is. Um, been done for centuries, thousands of years. That's been happening. In this case, there is a relationship that happens. Um, as we're going to see, Bilha is definitely in the picture and is around Jacob. Um, but really, what happened to these concubines? We we don't really know. We don't know what the normal course of events would be for the life in the life of a concubine. 
So, um, Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a son. So you can see that she has a baby. Which, by the way, at this point, is this, I mean, this is Rachel's son, but isn't she starting to feel even worse that everyone's having children with my husband except for me? So she gets what she wants, which is a baby. But in the end, like Sarah, doesn't she feel a little sick with the fact that this is also just another testament to the fact that this wasn't a fluke that my wife could have a baby with Leah. Now can have a can have a child with, with Bill. And Rachel said, God has vindicated me. Indeed, God has heeded my plea and given me a son. Therefore, she named him Don. Now, the word, the name Don, it definitely has its root judgment or is in this case, the vindication is a legal vindication, if you will. The word vindicated here means like legally vindicated. It says Don, that God has judged in my favor. So that's why she says it names, she names him Don. Don is judgment, Dean. The word Dion is judge. Um, it's interesting because, again, it's not the clearest definition of the name, but she can say, you know, he's judged for me. He's, he's given me a victory, if you will, in the court. That's what the name, they say, comes from, derives from the word done. So, Rachel now has a son, Don, but it's through Bilha. And we're not done yet. Rachel's maid conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, a fateful contest I waged with my sister. Yes, and I have prevailed. So she named him Naphtali. Now, again, according to the Torah, the name Naphtali, um, it says in two different forms that the word is from Naphtuli, Naphtuli and Niftalti which is a contest, a, a game, if you will. And winning it, I have gained her. I have outplayed her. And that's what they say the name Naftali means. It means from a, the name, from the word contest, a game, that I have waged a game and I have won. I think it's strange that she thinks that she's won this game. Uh, she has two sons now. It's not exactly a victory to the four sons that she has. She's also had to have another woman come in and have the babies for her. But it doesn't really matter to her, at least. In her mind, she's won. She's won. She's gotten what she wanted. And what's so interesting about this is that, like, when you and I read this, part of us goes, and I don't think it's just us. I think it's been people in every generation. I think it was people when they first heard this. You, you kind of scratch your head and go, did you really win? Did you really win? Did you really outplay your sister here? Because you wound up with two more, two sons. Jacob wound up with two more sons. He's got two, you know, he's got six sons now. We you know he's halfway to full set, but he's got six sons now, and his her husband that she loves has now had to sleep with two other women to achieve that, and it's almost like a victory that she sees. But many people walking around would go, "Really?" She definitely feels that these are her sons. That Don and Naftali are her sons, that she now has something. So you and I might think she's a little delusional, but she didn't feel that way. She felt that she had won, that she finally was vindicated, that she was finally outplaying her sister. 
But I think to some extent, it really is a very human, it tells us a very human story, which is that, you know, when, when the guy walks away after, you know, losing everything, but, you know, walk, walks away with, you know, something, they think that they won. You know, it's like the gambler who walks around going, I just won $500. You go, well, but you lost $10,000. You've got a $500 pot, but you played $10,000. Or, like, you know, the person who goes to the carnival and walks away with a gift that, you know, with a stuffed animal they could have bought for $5, but they spent $500 on a stuffed animal. <laughs> you go, you're a nut. You just walked away with a $5 piece of garbage. So sometimes we win. We think we've won, and everyone else looks at us and goes, you're nuts. You, you think you won, but look what you had to give up in order to do that, and look what you really actually did win. And um, we don't know. We don't know how close Rachel was to these boys later on. It also kind of begs the question, let's revisit that, because she will eventually have children of her own, for, out of her own womb. Did the children that she essentially surrogated in the first place, right? She adopted, if you will, were they treated the same way as the children that she gave birth to? But we really don't know for sure. We don't want to speculate. But it could be that once she had children of her own, that down in Naphtali suddenly were not quite as important to Rachel as the two sons that she didn't have, Joseph and Benjamin. The only issue is she dies giving birth to Benjamin. So any real success she would have felt would have been very short-lived after Benjamin. But did she feel good after Joseph and having a baby? Don and Naftali kind of go into the background after Joseph is born? I don't know. I don't know. That's something to think about. What were Don and Naftali's like after, especially after the other two brothers are born? Were they raised that, sons? Did yeah. that often happen when people adopt children that they, and then they have another baby and that they have, they have a child out of their own womb and they they don't feel the same way about those children anymore? Yeah, there may be people, who, they're not on right now, I don't think, uh, but there are people who are in the synagogue who dealt with that uh, consequence. Uh, and uh, again, people were told that they never have kids, they adopted and they ended up having kids. It is, does not always, uh, it, I'll put it in the positive way. No, there's no positive way to put this. It doesn't work out well. A lot. And it's not just because the parents have suddenly said, hey, I don't, I don't care about this adopted kid. It's not my blood. I love this other kid. Sometimes it is, has nothing to do with what the parent does, but what the child internalizes. Mm -hmm. Every time they see their parents, you know, doing something loving for their birth children, they wonder, is that the way that they feel about me? And it is a real issue. It's not, I wish I could say that it wasn't. I had several cases. I've had, I had friends who were adopted and then their, their parents had kids and it was, it, you know, I would, yeah, I mean, I would tell you my friend and his sister who were both adopted had a lot of issues um, and it, it came about after their parents had, had uh, had babies long after they were told that they could never have babies. So it didn't, didn't, but again, I'm not just saying it's anecdotal. It's, it's kind of a, it's a known family dynamic. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's, I've known several cases in the last 20, 30 years as people have gone overseas for adoption where the children they, uh, that they adopted from overseas ended up really having a problem uh, with, the with once the parents have had, had children naturally and, and it, I don't I don't know if it's always worse but in some cases it's been it's been really bad um, those those uh, things have not worked out well for for the families so it, it's it's I mean you'd say well it shouldn't happen it doesn't have to happen yeah both of those things are true but I found it to happen a lot more than it doesn't happen. Um, so what happened to Don and Naftali? We don't know. Uh, they definitely don't become as important as Joseph and Benjamin. That we do know. Uh, so when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing children, 
she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a concubine. So she plays the same game. She says, I can't have kids anymore, but look what's happening over here. So if Rachel thought that she won the game, Leah takes up that mantle and says, well, let's see, I can play that game too. That's exactly what she does. Zilpah, when Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son, Leah said, what luck? And so she named him God. So here the word, the name God is connected to fortune or luck. Ba God. Uh, luck has come to me. And so he's named God. Very simple. And guess what? She has another son. They come in batches. When Ma Leah's maid Zilpah uh, bore Jacob a second son, Leah declared, what fortune? Which is very much like the luck. Uh, but this is fortune or blessing or, or uh, great thing, uh, meaning women will deem me fortunate. So she named him Asher. And again, Leah be Ashri, in my, my fortune, my Osher. So the word Asher or Osher means good things, you know, blessings, uh, extra luck. It has the same kind of connotation as God, but we definitely use the word Osher, Asher a lot more uh, because it's became a much, and it's a much more common Hebrew word for luck or for blessing or for goodness. And it's why the name Asher was a very popular Jewish name for centuries. It's not as popular anymore. I actually use the name Osher. Osher, yeah. Yeah, o o Osher in Yiddish. Oisher uh, was was uh, a very popular name, and uh, and and then Asher coming out of it. Asher is probably one of those biblical names that there were. It was definitely Gentiles used the name, but um, but uh, definitely was very popular for for Jews. It's less a lot less popular today. I don't see as many Ashers anymore. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice name. And, and, and again, when we have the prayer of the Ashray, it begins with Ashray, you know, oh. Ashray. And so the, the name Asher is, uh, means how fortunate, Ashray Yoshvei Techa, how fortunate, how blessed are the people who sit in your house. And uh, so it doesn't mean, God definitely has more of a connotation of luck. You know, like being good at gambling and cards, whatever, you know, being there at the right place at the right time. Uh, fortune has not as great of a, of, a, of a translation because it really does mean like a treasure or a blessing. That's another word for it, treasure. What a treasure. Um, what a blessing. What a gift. That's what uh, the word Asha means. So she has two, two more. So now we're up to eight. Now, now Jacob is up to eight sons. Uh, four with Leah, four with the concubines. But it's four, two, and two. So when people go, well, I can't remember how, well, some people forget whether it was Bilhah or Zilpah first, but again, Bilhah was introduced by, Le by Rachel because Leah had only had kids, only Leah had kids. And then Leah in response gives them Zilpah, which is <clears throat> the next two. So it's four, two, and two. And we're not done. Because we're only up to eight. We got, we're we're now, we're now three quarter or two thirds of the way there. Sorry, two thirds of the way there, and now uh, wait a second, three quarters of the way there. So, right. So uh, we move up here a little bit. And now we're going to read a little excursus, if you will. We're going to read a little weird story <laughs> in the midst of the children. It's kind of weird way to read it. Once. At the time of the wheat harvest, Reuben came upon some mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of, some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, was it not enough for you to take away my husband, that you should also take away my son's mandrakes? Rachel replied, I promise he shall lay with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. The word for... Um, Mandrakes in Hebrew is dudai, 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 mandrake. 
Now we know that mandrakes are magical, magical root. We actually talked that we talked about it. We talked about it. we talked about it before in class because the mandrakes were used as um, uh, for for potions and for spells. The mandrake was considered to be as uh, it was in the uh, Jewish tradition as it was in other cultures. We've They're also, also good for pain relief. Yeah. Um, but I, I read that like if you took too much of it, it would make you hallucinate. Um, so you had to be pretty careful with it, but it could also um, alleviate like tooth pain and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was much worse than that. Uh, in in uh, not the Torah, but later on in the Midrash and, and in other sources, in, even in the Talmud, in Jewish sources, and there are other sources too, that if you were not careful, when you harvested mandrakes, you would die. Just picking up the mandrakes could kill you. And again, it's in Harry Potter. So just so you know, I didn't make this up. <laughs> Harry Potter, there's a scene where they're working with mandrakes and they scream when you pull them out. And that's because mandrakes a little bit look like people, where well, they don't always look like people, but you could get a mandrake when you pulled it out that looked kind of like a person. Now, if you're going to say, are you kidding me? Look it up. There are pictures. I actually could show you the pictures right now yeah. where mandrakes look like people. They so so look a little like, uh, like ginger root, and then they've got these purple flowers on their head, but they do sometimes look like a whole person with their, the way their roots branch off, like two limbs and um, two arms and two legs. My students loved making them. We had a lot of fun um, when we went through this passage and made mandrakes. Yeah, so, so the, the problem was is that people uh, throughout the ancient world would think that the mandrake had some kind of power, especially over us, over humans, because they occasionally look like humans. Uh, I don't think they look that much like humans, but uh, but that's what they call them. And that's kind of like the word, you know, in Hebrew, it means kind of like a twin, um, but uh, but it's twinned up with, with people. Um, I'll show you this one. This one's kind of funny. Um, this is the, the mandrake. The mandrake that definitely looks like a man. Um, here's, here's mythological things of mandrakes, but again, this idea of mandrakes with how with people is, uh, was very pervasive in the ancient world and was one of the reasons why um, they asked for the mandrakes, because what does she want with the mandrakes? What does, what does Rachel want with the mandrakes? She wants and she believes that perhaps the mandrakes will give her child. And having the mandrake, it's not an aphrodisiac, but it's actually going to be a fertility uh, magic to it. And it'll allow her to have children having the mandrakes. So Reuben finds it. Leah's oldest son finds him. And remember, he's the oldest son. So he's out hunting or foraging, whatever, and comes across the mandrakes. And so he asks, uh, Rachel sees them and wants them. Now, of course, Leah says, fine. Now she says, you've taken my husband. Now, if anything, Leah took her husband. But that in Leah's mind, Rachel has her husband's heart. Now, no matter whether Jacob wanted to marry her in the first place, she's married to him. And maybe this whole time, Again, we know she said it. Every time she has a kid, she says, maybe my husband will love me now. Maybe now, even still, that's all she wants is to be loved by her husband. She doesn't seem to have given up on it by what she just said. Was it enough for you to take away my husband? Now you want to take my mandrakes. So she does trade them. So ironically, so as though Rachel wants them for her own fertility, but in order for her to get them, she has to give Leah another crack at being pregnant. But what's interesting about this is it basically says that Jacob wouldn't sleep with 
Leah unless Rachel gave him permission. So it's very clear from this that Leah is not sleeping with Jacob on a regular basis. This is, uh, this is what we just read. She says, I want to sleep with my husband. And so she says, Rachel says back, we will lie with you. This is a story in the Bible. This is not a midrash. This is moving the story ahead so that what can happen for all of us can happen. The story of the Mannerings. When Jacob came home from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you are to sleep with me, for I have hired you with my son's mandates. <laughs> and he lay with her that night. God heeded Leah, and she conceived and bore him a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my reward for having given my maid to my husband. She named him Issachar. So this is the birth of now the ninth child, Issachar. Uh, and the word, the root for Issachar is the word Sachar. In this case, Sachari, my reward. A Sachar is a reward. So Issachar is a reward. And she says it's forgiving her maid to her husband. So in her mind, the last act that she did by giving Zilpa to Jacob, she feels like she's being rewarded now because now she's had another child. I mean, you, you would say, well, that's delusional as well. But it shows you the human emotions that are real, which are that people make weird decisions and they justify it. And they feel comfortable with them. She seems very comfortable with this right now. She, she says, this is my reward. My son that I just had is a reward. It's, that's what just happened. She got to sleep with her husband finally again. We don't know how long that had been going on for. I mean, the, the assumption here is that after he sleeps with Zilpa, he's not sleeping. He can go back to sleeping with him. Maybe he didn't even sleep with her before that. We don't know. But this poor woman is doesn't have a lot of warmth or love coming from her husband. But she's still naming her kids positive names. Exactly. So, so her... Her, her names are not based on sadness or desire or jealousy or her own feelings of insecurity. And she's turned it, she's twisted. So again, perhaps she's delusional, but she's no longer angry or depressed. She's no longer naming these kids for the things that she doesn't have, which is primarily her husband's love. You're absolutely right. She has not gone back to the negativity that she has at the beginning of the red vein that God has seen my affliction. So she's still seeing this as good. This is good stuff for her. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Now, he had had, this was now his tenth son, but it was her sixth son. He's now had six sons. Leah said, God has given me a choice gift. This time my husband will exalt me, for I have borne him six sons. Word Zvulun is a root is Yez Eleni. Word Zvul or to or to have a gift. God has given me a gift. And so that she names him Zvulun. So, again, to Gail's point, it's a nice, it's a nice name, but it's very clear that 
she's still looking for her husband's marriage. My husband will exalt me now. So I've given him six sons. And that's big. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, period. Because when you do the math, it's not very hard to do. It's six is half of 12. Half really? of the 12 tribes. That's right, Mike. See how quickly wow. I did that? 50% of Jacob's sons, 50% are from Leah, which means all the other three added up to the same amount that Leah produced. So Leah was responsible, again, for half the sons. It's pretty amazing. Because the other ones, as we're going to see, the other three are two, two, two. So, Leah is pretty important. Yep. It says, I exalt you, but it says, because I have born him six sons, now my husband goes well with me. Yep. And, the, and I, was to, I just shared it up here. This one is also okay. given as a possible understanding. Um, the word Yisbelani. It's a very weird word uh, for exalt. It's a very weird, it's not a commonly used root at all. Uh, and again, were all of these names written backwards in the sense that, not that the names weren't written backwards, but that the names already existed and the author is trying to come up with ways of giving them meaning. Uh, this is because that's a possibility. The tribes were already known by these names and putting them into this context was an attempt to bring all these tribes together. I mean, that's the theory, the operating theory that goes through biblical scholarship is that you have a group of tribes that believe that they're all connected to each other. Some of them seem to have names that are based on a person. Not all of them, by the way. Not all of them. The name of Ephraim seems to really not be named after a person based on the structure of the name. The, 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 the syntax of the name. But regardless, the possibility that the names existed and then the author of the Bible wanted to explain how we all came together through this, these births, this amazing birthing of four women. Look, I can only tell you this. The names are important for the story. If we look at what happened over this chapter, most of this chapter were explanations of what these names mean. That's the majority of these verses. Because otherwise, the Bible, and the Bible doesn't always do that. The Bible, sometimes it does explain things. You know, it says at the very beginning, Adam and Eve were named what they were, and, and they're they their but, Sometimes they're word plays. You know, names, they can give you a clue. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in this case, the Bible doesn't let us guess what they are. It tells us flat out what these names mean and gives them context. But in the context, in this story, what we see is a family dynamic where two women are struggling to have children and to have their husband's affection. And Jacob, interestingly, in this story, only makes an appearance when he gets mad at his wife and says, this is not my fault. Other than that, Jacob doesn't do anything. Jacob is a passive participant in this having babies time. Part of it. He's part of it, but he doesn't really do anything other than at one point at the beginning say, what are you getting mad at me for? This isn't up to me. In the meantime, he really doesn't do anything in the story. But women going back and forth. I mean, you know, it's hard to it's Or what? Yeah. Where would you be? <laughs> I don't know. By the way, it, nobody asked Jacob whether he wanted to have Bill and Zilpah's concubines. It seems like the women just say to him, this is what you're doing. It doesn't say they asked him or they had to get his permission. It doesn't say that, by the way. I want to put that out there. We don't know what the ritual was like other than it says that they bore on the knees. But we don't know what the ritual was like other than the, when it seems like the wife says, you got to go out. Now, we don't... We, we, we don't know what concubines did all the time, by the way. I wanted to tell you, the Bible is not really clear what the role of a concubine is, other than she is a quasi-wife. But did she... If, if Will and Zilpa are, are, are Leah and Rachel's maids up until that time, until they actually sleep with Jacob, at that point they become concubines. 
So at that point, there's a different word used for them, and now they are um, now they are not uh, now they're no longer just maids. Interestingly, and I will point this out because we just read it in the verse above. If you look, when Leah gives it names him Issachar, it's my reward for giving my maid to my husband. Now she calls him a maid. She didn't say, I gave my husband a concubine. She says, I gave, now again, when she gave him to him, she was a maid, a shivcha. And when, after he sleeps with her, she's now not a shivcha. She is, as you can see right here, with the word that's used. Uh, whoa. Right there. No, no, no. It's uh, here, I will tell you, it does not say when it calls Zilpa, it calls her Leah's maid. It says Shivcha, and he used the word maid again. It does not use the word for concubine. I will tell you, let me just see right up here. Interesting. They use the word concubine here they use the word concubine here in neither place did they use the word what does your translation by the way mary say in verse uh four it, when it says and handmaid he, to wife a handmaid yeah to wife yeah well that is the word there let you shot to become like a wife uh here they translated it as a concubine. They didn't translate the word uh, isha as a wife. They translated it as a concubine. But here the word shivcha is used throughout. And I will tell you, technically speaking, uh, that's the word they use here for, the, for them. They did not use the other word pilegesh, which is the word that we normally see. When we read the story of Judges, uh, before the word pilegesh was the word which is the word for concubine. So there is a Hebrew word for concubine. The word When you see the word isha, there's no difference in that word be between an isha, and here it is right here. The word isha is used, it's to be a wife. When it says Leah gave her as a concubine, it says la isha. That's not, that's not, that's not, there's no difference la isha. Then when you say my wife, that's my isha, that's my wife. That's the word for wife. So interestingly, they don't use the word for concubine at all in this chapter. They use the word either shivcha, which is maiden, and, or they use the word isha, which is wife. So when they're having babies, it seems as though they're really like a wife. Though interestingly, as we said, she says, she says, Leah says right here, I gave my, my, um, I gave my husband my maid. So she, but again, when she gave him to her, she was a maid. She didn't say, I gave my husband a wife. I gave my husband a maid. He made her his wife or his concubine. It's interesting because, again, they never use the word for concubine, actually. Now, um, the next line, verse 21, it says, last, she bore him a daughter and named her Dina. So that's all we read about Dina. She's... Literally, that's all, that's all it says. It does not explain the name. So, just anything. When it says she, we're, we're thinking it, it's Leah, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the previous verse says that Leah right. did it. And the name Dina comes from the same root as Don, which means to judge or be vindicated. And so the name Dina means you know, again, vindication or judge, but it doesn't explain it. it. doesn't explain her name. It doesn't say her name. Now, you could again say, well, because she doesn't have a tribe. There's not a tribe that's going to go back and say, what does our name mean? Yeah. You could make the argument that really Reuben and Shimon, at least the reasons that are given there, are, are negative from the standpoint of, you know, God's not loving, you know, God's making up for my husband not loving me. So but we're not done because there's two more names coming up. Yeah. The question is, you know, we have the 12 tribes and then we have Dina. Well, Dina, obviously, you know, she gets, I'm assuming she will get married and have kids. What would so, happen to them? Yeah, where do they go? So 
we don't know what happens other than she gets maybe raped or taken advantage of, which we're going to read in a few right. chapters. Did she, did she have a kid with, with uh, this guy? Well, there's a whole book about that called The Red Tent that came out a few years ago by Anita Diamond, which is based on the Midrash on that. She based it on traditional Midrash, which she did indeed have a child. According to the Midrash, she has a child, a daughter actually, and that daughter is Osnat. And Osnat becomes the wife of Joseph. So why do the rabbis like that midrash? Because they don't like the idea that Joseph ends up marrying some random Egyptian woman. So the, the midrash is, is that Osnat, daughter of Potiphera, Potiphera adopts this child, Osnat, as a baby, and raises her, and never knows that she, in effect, in, in effect is Joseph's niece, which is totally illegal in the Bible to marry your niece. So that maybe he's not recommended, but is 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 possible that Joseph again marries Dina's daughter, and so then he marries into the family, and the lineage does not get broken, and Ephraim and Manasseh are not the sons of an Egyptian priest. So do we hear about after the rape? Do we hear anything more about Dina? Nope. You don't. We don't hear another word about Dina, which is why we can have midrash about her. Right. And again, we need a diamond. <laughs> You know, blew right. that, blew that up, but uh, uh, that midrash made it even bigger, more powerful. But this idea that uh, this idea that what would have happened to Dina's kids? Look, I did a lot of midrash, a lot of sleuthing, a lot of research on Dina before we named our daughter Dina. I wanted to know about the Dina name. And there, there's a lot of midrash about Dina because what happened to her, right? And so it's, people wanted to know. And there's an interesting midrash that Dina was actually supposed to be married to Esau. Why? Well, Esau was her uncle. And Esau, if, she, if, if he had married Dina, because he married to these other women, you know, of, if he had married Dina, he would have been brought back into the family, into the fold. And that Dina and Esau would have had kids that maybe wouldn't have been part of the tribes, but they would have been part of our blood. They would have been Jacob's descendants too. And they would have, and Esau would have in some ways been redeemed. And so there's an interesting midrash that's based on the fact that we don't know where Dina is when Esau and Jacob reunite. But the Midrash is based on the fact that by Jacob concealing Dina from Esau, she winds up being raped. Which is a really strange Midrash, but it's, it's, almost, it's almost, again, blaming Jacob for her rape. But that because he did not marry her to Esau, she winds up having this horrible thing come on her, on, onto her because she was supposed to be married. She ideally should have been married to Esau, which was kind of creepy because Esau would have been way older than her. Like, you know, Esau by this point is 60. But there's this idea that somehow she, he would have been redeemed by her. Because there's no other way, I mean, in all fairness, where does this Midrash come from? There's no way, other way for Esau to be rehabilitated or brought back into the community other than by marrying into the family. And according to what we know, Jacob didn't have any other daughters. I mean, he is going to have granddaughters, which, you know, by the way, could have been roughly the same age as, as Dina, because Dina's born so late. Reuben is already old enough to maybe not have kids, but could be. Uh, definitely seems to be old enough to have kids by the time Joseph is born. So this is what happens in this family dynamic, is the family is growing. There is more opportunities for good things, but there are also more opportunities for things to go sideways. And Dina definitely, the, her story definitely goes sideways. There's no question that something happens with her being born into this family and where what is her role? Was she supposed to be married to, she's not supposed, no way she can be married to her brothers. But what happens to this woman? Who is she supposed to be married to? That's essentially what the rabbis kind of ask themselves is who could she have been married to? That would have been legit. I mean, she'd been married to she'd been married to Ishmael, he's way too old. 
but but she would have been her his grandfather, her grandfather's age. But what you know, what are you left with? Um, could she have been married back into into Laban's family? Well, that would have been working backwards. So it's not a it's not there's not an easy answer, and the rabbis were kind of left with that because again, my question is, well, what happens to her? I mean, she's she's got to be married to somebody. And so, again, to some extent, the rabbi said, well, because she wasn't married to somebody, that's why the story of Shechem happens. And again, we'll read that and we'll have a chance to look at that story. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the story, though, that once she's raped, her value is gone? She wouldn't become a wife of someone. Well, yeah. I mean, it could be that she never had another husband again. I mean, that's, an, that's right. another very real possibility. Look, we're going to read this in... in Four chapters from now, we're going to look at the story of, of Dina, and it's not a—it's obviously a horrible story in a lot of for a lot of ways, but we don't learn anything about her other than that story, and we don't have anything from here, chapter right here in this chapter, chapter thirty to chapter thirty-four. We don't read about her again, and we don't read about her afterwards. So we don't know, and we don't have a list of her appearing in the Exodus. We don't learn about her descendants, and and it is it is interesting because there people have said, including again in Anita Diamond's book, there's this theory that she kind of perpetuates, which is that it really was important who your mother was. When we look at the stories and we we look at the tribes later on, they're all the sons of Jacob. What differentiates these kids and their tribes is who their mother was. It's not about who their father. We know who their father is. They're all the same father. But what really creates these differences in their lives and in the trajectory of the tribes is who their mothers are. Because if we look at the tribe of Rachel, we call them the tribes of Rachel, which is the tribe of, of Jacob, uh, Joseph, and Benjamin. We haven't gotten there. We're about to get there. When we look at those two tribes, those tribes are major, powerful tribes. The tribes of Rachel are major, major, major tribes. The tribes of Bilhah and Zilpah, which again, as you just saw, just read them, I'm not going to test you on them, but they're Donna and Naphtali, right? And God and Asher. I got in this card, sorry. No, God and Asher. I'm sorry. Donna and Naphtali, God and Asher. Um, sometimes you get Asher and this card next to it, but Asher and this card. Uh, Asher and, and God. We all look alike. <laughs> yeah, there is a midrash that they all did look alike. But four of them, actually, there's a midrash that the, the Bilhah and Zilpah kids, the Bilhah kids look like the Rachel kids, and the Zilpah kids look like look like uh, Leah's kids. But but um, so Rachel knew who Dan and Naphtali could tell Dan and Naphtali were kind of her from another tribe. Anyways, the point is is that Donna, that those four tribes, those Dan and Naphtali. God and Asher really don't become major forces in the Bible later on. Those tribes do not mix. And they're not in the mix. We don't learn a lot about those tribes. We just don't, we just don't know about them. Really the other thing I, I see with the story, this whole story is very sad because women at least are seeing that they're worth it and that they're children, how many children they can have. And, and Dina, when she's raped, she's lost her value, her worth. Well, you know, the women are, were um, possessions. It's very possible. Hold that up and, and be there in a couple of weeks when you read that story to Dina. Because, it, you know, again, it, it, look, I knew when I, did, when I named my daughter Dina that one day she was going to read the story. One day we're going to have to talk about the story. One day she's going to ask me, you gave me a name that is charged with the stuff, you know? And, uh, and believe me, in the back of my mind, I thought about that. And it's actually worse than that. Because we also named her, her middle name is Tamar. And we're going to read the story of Tamar. <laughs> so I, I just went for the whole thing. I just, I rolled the dice and said, we're going to give her the name of two biblical women. And actually, and she three, still talks to three biblical women. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, we always wondered, like, what would happen when she finally became a woman? What, what these stories would mean to her? And uh, listen, the reality is, is there's a lot of women named Dina. And there's a lot of right. women named Tamar. There, Dina was, there's not a lot of women named with both. But Dina, Dina was uh, well, Dina. Mother was Dina. What? Tova's mother, my friend. Was, was, was Dina? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so Dino was a legitimately popular name uh, for Jews and somewhat popular in Israel. Definitely was popular in Russia, actually. A lot of Russians who are named Dina, Russian women named Dina are actually, their names were Dina and they're, they're Russian, Rus Russified names were Dina. But they were Dinas. Um, it was a very popular name. Uh, there aren't many women names in the Bible. I mean, you think about it, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And then we have Dina. You go to the next generation. That's the only name we have with Jake, with the, with the generation of Jacob's sons of the tribes. Dina is the only name. So here we have all these other names that pop up. And again, not all the names, as I said, pop up. God very rarely pops up in, as a Hebrew name. Uh, Actually, her real name was Antonia. Antonia? Yeah. That's, that's a, a, definitely not a, but it's, a, it's connected. Some of those names are connected to Dina. Yeah. But um, but we have these names that we have of those 12 tribes that we use all the time. Reuben was used, Reuven was used all the time. Asher, as you said, was used all the time. Judah was used all the time. Uh, Shimon, Simon was used a lot. A lot of these names were used. And then the only name we have of all those names that we could use would be Dean. So it was used a lot. But it was definitely a charged name based on one. And again, we'll look at it in a few weeks. We'll read the story of Dina. It is one of the most demanding and disturbing stories uh, in, in the book of Genesis. It is just, every time you read it, you walk away going, I can't believe that stories of the Bible. I can't believe that this is like, how do we make sense of this? You walk away, not never feeling like you got an answer. You never walk away from the story of Dina and go, well, that makes sense, or that's the way it should be. You just go, whoa, I'm just shaken by it. So we'll, we'll read about what happens to Dina later. Um, and again, um, yeah, hopefully uh, my demon does not have anything like that in her life. Anyways, so God remembered Rachel. And by the way, I named my oldest daughter Rachel. And I also named her, her middle name is Hannah. Rachel and Hannah both together never could have kids, right? So you could say that I condemned my daughter Rachel that named her after two of the most famous barren women. Now, of course, they both end up having kids, as we're about to see. God remembered Rachel, and God heeded her and opened her womb. And again, that's the word. It says vayiskor, that God remembered. The word vayiskor, it's covered up in there, but here, I'll, I'll move it over so people can see there. Vayiskor, the word we use for yiskor, right? The word, word we word, use the word zachar, God remembers. Um, like what, God forgot that she existed? But... When God opens up her womb, and again, the word here that's used is rachama, that this is the, the, the uh, mercy. God remembers her and opens her up. Her. Now, again, this is not the first time that we've had this kind of situation. We had it with Rachel, with uh, Sarah. And so Sarah and Rachel both are remembered, if you will, by God. Uh, in that case, it was Sarah was told by God that she's going to have a baby, and then God kind of remembers that now. Here, there's no, it's the same um, same term that is used with Noah, and God remembers Noah. Yeah, and again, clearly it doesn't mean that you know God had forgotten about them, but that God takes account of them, and it's a different word. Pakad is is also a word that we have uh, regards to Sarah, uh, that God poked God God remembers her, or redeems her, or uh, and again, Pakad has it as even more of a connotation of takes note of account has an accounting of her here. God remembers her in the sense that now God will listen to her is what it says. God remembers, God hears her. And then it says, and he opened God opens her womb. And so finally, after literally 10 children, 11 children, including Dina, 11 children, she conceived and bore a son. And she said, God has taken away my disgrace. And what's interesting is, this is the root that it says for Asa. God has taken away my which is the word for disgrace. 
to the group here. Look, it seems as though the word Yosef and the word Asaf, the easy understanding of that is that God has added to me. The word Yosef or Asaf means to add to. It means to increase. But clearly, it's somehow connected to the word disgrace. Now, God has not added to my disgrace. That wouldn't seem to make sense because he's finally given her what she's been asking for her whole life with him, which is a baby. God's given me a baby. Now, what's interesting about this is that now Jacob, now all the wives have had it. All the women have had it. Yeah, I said wives. They all have a kid. They've all had. They've all had a child. Now. And of course, Jacob is the one who's been added to. But as Rachel says now, uh, God has. Uh, God has made it so that I'm not disgraced. So even though she had had these children through Bilha, she still feels disgraced. She just admitted it. So the delusion that she has that this is the game that she's won seems to have evaporated in this moment when she says, God has taken away my disgrace. Oh yeah, and here's the line. So, so she named him Joseph, which is say, may God add another son for me. So uh, uh, that's the more logical um, it almost as if that first line doesn't even make sense. Um, I'm going to just tell you something very clearly here. This line that really doesn't make sense is not written by the same author. Somebody just threw Joseph under the bus. How do we know this? Because that makes no sense. The second one makes 100% sense. She named him Joseph, which is may Adonai add. Again, the word Yosef is the son. How do we know this? Why am I making this up? I'm not making this up. I didn't make it up. I didn't even say it first. The clear key here is that the first line says, Asaf Elohim. Here we have the name Elohim used. And here... We go back to Adonai. And so it's very clear that there's two versions of this naming for Joseph the Painter. One from one of the speculate that there was a, a little dig at Joseph or something. I don't know, but there were two versions of the name that were two versions of why he was named that. I don't look the reason we have two versions and they're very different from each other. One of them makes a lot more sense and uses the name Adonai, and one of them says God, Elohim. Very clear. There's sometimes when, as I said, I don't point it out a lot, but there's sometimes when I have to. As you literally say, this is uh, a very different reading. Now, I'm going to finish up with these next couple of lines. And Rachel had born Joseph. After Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, give me leave to go back to my home. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go. For you know what services I have rendered you. So what happens here? He says, I want to go home. Now you're going to say to yourself, well, wait a second. Aren't there 12 sons? Daughter? Yes. You are right. But when Jacob packs up and gets ready to go, he only has 11 sons and one daughter by that point. Benjamin is not born in Aram. He's the only one of the sons that's born in the land of Israel. So think about what that means, too. That the Benjaminites are the only tribe that, according to the Bible, actually began in the land of Israel. So think about the political ramifications of saying, the tribe of Benjamin, the youngest tribe, the smallest tribe, or one, not one, not the smallest, but one of the smallest tribes, actually have to almost wiped out. They become the smallest tribe. But this tribe, which also gives forth 
forth the first king, as we're reading on Tuesday mornings. In our Tuesday morning class, we read about King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Only one that's actually born in the land of Israel. We'll read about him next week. We're, we didn't read about the last child. Finish up because this is the story of, of, uh, of, of um, Jacob. It's time for me to go. It's time for me to fly. The Bob said to him, if you indulge me, I have learned by divination that Adonai has blessed me on your account. And here he uses the name Adonai. But Bon actually says Adonai here. He says, again, the translation here is, if you will indulge me, if, you, if I have found favor in your eyes. And he says, I have learned through divination that you know, I've used this, this sorcery, this magic that I've used. And by the way, that's not a good thing to admit. You're not supposed to do magic. And again, Laban is not, he's not a descendant of Isaac. He's Isaac's, he's Isaac's cousin. He's not Isaac's, he's not, he's not Abraham's child, but he's from the family and he shouldn't be doing magic and divination. But what did the divination say? It said, Jacob, you're, I'm being blessed because of you. <laughs> I'm being blessed because of you. And he continued, name the wages due for me and I will pay you. But he said, you know well I have served you and how well and how your livestock have fared with me. For the little, for the little you had before I came has grown too much since Adonai has blessed you wherever I turn. And now, when shall I make provision for my own household? I, I know how much I've given you. And now it's time for you to give me something. So up until now, you've given me two wives. But I need money. I need to start on my own. He said, what shall I pay you? And Jacob said, pay me nothing. You will do this thing for me. I will again pastor and keep your flocks. Let me pass through your whole flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted animal, every dark colored sheep and every spotted and speckled goat. Those shall be my wages. In the future, when you go over my wages, let my honesty toward you testify to me. There among my goats, any that are not speckled or spotted or any sheep that are not dark colored, they got there by theft. So he tells them, I only want the speckled sheep. I only want the ones that, again, are not necessarily the prettiest sheep, but he knows a little something here about genetics. We always like to say that Jacob is going to outplay his uncle, who's very clever, very clever, Laban, but he's no match for Jacob. Not only because Jacob isn't using magic, he's, he's got God on his side. But here's what he tells him. Bond says, okay, very well. Let it be as you say. But the same day, he removed the streaked and spotted he goats and all the speckled and spotted she goats, every one of them that had any white on it, and all the dark colored sheep and left them in charge of his sons. And he put a distance of three days between himself and Jacob while Jacob was pasturing the rest of Laban's flock. So what did Laban do? He took out all the, the speckled sheep thinking that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him. I'm going to leave only solid sheep behind and goats behind. And, uh, and then Jacob won't get anything. So he does a very bad thing. He gets them out and he says he gets them three days away. So there's not going to be any of these. He's kind of a nice man. Anyway. Not a nice man. He's a very, very, very yes. bad guy. Yes, yes. So Jacob then got fresh shoots of poplar, of almond and plain, and peeled white stripes in them, laying bare the white of the shoots. The rods that he had peeled he set in front of the goats in the troughs, the water receptacles that the goats came to drink in. Their mating occurred when they came to drink. Well, that's not actually untrue. And since the goats mated by the rods, the goats brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted young. Now that seems a little strange. Because look at this. Goats end up having children that are speckled because they looked at these rods that were in the water. Somehow that created it. 
Now, you and I know he didn't need to do that. The rabbis knew a long time ago he didn't need to do that. Why? Because genetically, these goats all have genes in them that would give forth speckled goats. Just like all he did was take out, you know, genetically any child that was blue eyed and then took them all out and only left brown eyed children there. But two parents who have brown eyes could still have a blue eyed child. It's a recessive gene. Colors that the goats have a recessive gene could happen. Not only could happen, it does happen. It's not a guarantee. So the people said, so what was this whole shit with the, with the popular, with putting these things on? Now, some people say he did it so that he could make it look like a miracle had happened. He made it look like he had magic too. Because we already know that LeBron says he has magic. And here's what we're going to finish with. Jacob dealt separately with the sheep. He made these animals face the streaked or woolly, holy dark animals in Laban's flock. And so he produced special flocks for himself, which he did not put with Laban's flocks. Moreover, when the sturdier animals were mating, and then you see the note, or early green animals, they could place the rods in the troughs in full view of the animals so they mated by the rods. But with the feebler animals, he did not place them there. Thus, the feeble ones went to Laban and he took the sturdy to Jacob. So what he did was actually real genetic engineering, which is that he made sure that he only took, not again, knowing that they could have different colored animals, he knew that healthy looking animals were gonna have healthier, most likely healthier looking children. And so that's what he did with the animals. He took out the ones that were not, not worrying about what color they were, he took them out. So again, was he using magic? Did he have some magic? Maybe. But we also know he didn't have to have magic, and the rabbis knew that a long time ago. So they basically said he was playing with Laban, and he was playing with everybody else who would look at him and say, oh, he's got magic. He didn't have magic. He had smarts. He knew, again, basic things about shepherding, you know, about husband, animal husbandry, which people knew a long time ago. He, wasn't, he didn't invent this. He just happened to take advantage of Laban's greed, Laban's stupidity, and to some extent, Laban's uh, reverence of magic. And so the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks, maidservants, camels, and asses. Now, uh, next week, we're going to come back and read 31, which actually starts with this story uh, in continuation of the story of the animals. Uh, why is there a chapter break here? Mainly because of the length of it. We do not, this is still a part of the same Torah portion. And when we come back next week to read chapter 31, we're going to see what happens in that. But literally, I know it's amazing to think this entire chapter that we read today, chapter 30, was mostly about, and we could have only read the story of the kids and of how all these children were born to Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Bilha, and Zilpah, but mostly Leah. So everybody, we want to wish you a good evening. And uh, again, thank you everybody for being here tonight, for uh, being part of tonight's group. We ended up having even more people join up. And so Mike, you had a chance to say uh, Kaddish for a very dear part of your, of your life. And uh, we want to thank everybody for doing that. And um, again, we'll be having services virtually this, this uh, Friday night, but we'll uh, see you next week, next Tuesday or next Wednesday. And we're actually going to make an announcement about the next in our speaker series, which John Kogan is putting together, uh, uh, we're now back into this. We're actually going to have it in yeah. February uh, in a couple of weeks. We're going to let you know about that. I will fire up for that. Love you, Joyce. Love you. Love you. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Take care. Stay healthy, everybody. Stay safe. You too. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. You know, I have